Ikra is the beginning of our story. The word is the center of our relationship to, to our creator. And we have a particular way of receiving tajweed or receiving calligraphy that uh, celebrates the sacrality of the word. But eventually, the ulama decided that printing was something that the Muslim world had to accommodate. And today, alhamdulillah, you go into uh, bookshops throughout the Muslim world, and so much is now available that would have been available only to small numbers of people in earlier generations. And there is benefit as well as harm in this development. Our age is witnessing the unparalleled acceleration of new technologies in the area of um, information technology and uh, the processing of information. It's not an age of wisdom, but it's an information age. Uh, it's an age in which all discourses, all forms of knowledge seem to be on a level playing field. You look at a website and you have no means of knowing whether this is run by some uh, half-mad sex member or whether it's made by a considerable body of representatives of a major world religion. Just on the face of it, you can't tell. There's an anonymity and a leveling that does tend to level everything down. And one of the, the real challenges for religions in the modern world is to figure out where we can go and where we can't go in the context of these new media technologies. What is permissible and what is not permissible. The medium itself, on balance, has a deleterious, destructive effect on people, particularly on young people. Because now at the click of a switch, anywhere in the world, um, if you're a weak person, you can import into your own uh, living room the ugliest images that have occurred to the ugliest souls anywhere on the planet. It's available a couple of clicks away. That has a very destructive and deleterious consequence. But it's also the case that you can now have access, if you have the right intention, to information that, particularly if you're, like many Muslims in the modern West, living at some distance from centers of Islamic learning, can genuinely connect you to the center of the tradition and to the major scholars. One of the uh, blessings of the internet and of DVDs and of digital technology generally, satellite, cable, TV channels with an Islamic content now, is that isolated Muslim communities can now be uh, uh, embedded. These uh, Brazilians who emailed me yesterday, it seems that their access to Islam would have been impossible in their town in Brazil, but for the existence of these new media but at a couple of clicks they were able to find things on the website and they got in touch with me and a couple of, 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 of scholars and now um, they're moving towards the Tawheed of Islam. So although our tradition is rightly skeptical of the extraordinarily destructive and corrupting influences that uh, mass technology can provide, nonetheless we can't quite ignore the fact that there can be benefits as well. The second point is that whether we like it or not, those technologies are there. Sky TV in England has a thousand channels, um, many of them unsavory, many of them trivial, and it is necessary, I think, that there be an availability of an Islamic voice for those who have nothing else to do but to sit at home and, and watch television, that there should be, if they have the desire, the possibility of making the right choice when they pick up the remote. So, with a group of friends reflecting on this a few years ago, we took the decision that the existing digital media to do with Islam and the Muslim world that serves the authentic, profound Tawheed of the Qur'an and, and the Sunnah is of a very low standard and that that is inappropriate. Just as in print technologies, nobody likes to see that, say, Karl Marx is beautifully printed, and Freud is beautifully printed, but then the Qur'an is kind of cheap and not very attractive. We all know that that certainly is wrong, and that it should be the most beautiful book. If it's going to be printed, make it better than everything else. Otherwise, people will draw their own conclusions about the sincerity of the people who are creating these cultural productions, and that will be uh, a negative judgment. So if we're going to get into these worlds, we have to be better than the alternatives. So we thought that Imam al-Ghazali Rahmatullahi Ali deserves to be served. People are thirsty. People are spiritually thirsty, particularly non-Muslims who are, despite everything, magnetized by Islam and come into Islam uh, all the time. 
and we need to have something to give them that is up to the standards that they're used to. What a dangerous psychological blow it would be for a new Muslim, say a student in a place like the University of Cambridge who is used to very high quality productions about everything. If the moment that they take shahada, the gifts that are pressed into their hands are kind of clunky and second rate, hard to understand, badly produced, stupid. What kind of psychological message are we giving those people if that is all we can offer? Instead, we have to be able to present something that is not only as good as everything that is out there in the world of secularity and of other religions, but something that is clearly better. The pioneer in this area was, of course, the, uh, the great uh, film made by Abdul Latif Salazar on uh, Imam al-Ghazali's life, The Alchemist of Happiness. Uh, that was certainly the most impressive, most authentic representation of, of classical Islam that has hit the silver screen in the last 10 or 20 years, and it has had an immense impact. Uh, the issue of how one actually presents the content of Imam al-Ghazali's message, rather than talking about it en route as one depicts his life, is more awkward. The classical Islamic formula is that of the sheikh who sits there in the mosque and he speaks for hours and people listen. On television nowadays, that doesn't work too well because people are used to something else. Because of the intense competition between channels, people's fingers get itchy and if nothing is moving or looking new or interesting on the screen within 10 seconds, they'll press the next button just to see what's going on uh, on the next channel. Just the talking head of the ustad or the imam just talking uh, is difficult to hold people's attention. They may manage it in the mosque, but on television they're going to get fidgety. So we had to think about exactly what we do about that. Uh, and to get the balance right between preserving the tradition, which is precisely the sheikh sitting in the mosque and being wise and holding the text and expounding the text on the basis of his ijazah in the text. And on the other hand, something that would be uh, cinematically interesting. So the formula that we came up with was a kind of elaboration of the tradition, in that each of these DVDs, and they last about an hour each, begins with Quranic recitation by one of the truly great Tajweed masters of the community where the lectures are being uh, recorded. And uh, as the Tajweed sounds for about two or three minutes, and even though, as we know, Tajweed is a solemn and a serious thing that makes us spiritually breathe deeply and we can feel the transformation in our bodies as we hear great Tajweed being recited. That's not always something that works on television, which likes everything to be fast and, uh, and, and snappy and, and rhythmical. We took the decision that that was how we were going to begin, just to create the right atmosphere, to fill the air with fragrance before the proceedings began. And while the Tajweed is being sounded, images of the mosque and the community where the traveling light episode is being recorded. And then we see the students entering the, the, the mosque or the zawiya, and then the sheikh is sitting there in a traditional fashion, in traditional dress, expounding the text which is before him in a traditional way, but in English, and ensuring that the exposition links the ancient wisdom of Imam Ghazali's text as meticulously as possible to the re relevances of people's day-to-day uh, -day contemporary concerns in order to bring the text to life. Halfway through each hour, there is uh, a break where there is a, a nasheed, and at the end, there's another nasheed as the credits roll. And we decided that for those nasheeds, we would be a little countercultural. There is a tendency in the Islamic Nasheed world, which is huge and, and growing, as, as you know, here in Malaysia, um, for it to be a little bit poppy and a little bit globalized. Uh, and for some of the more subtle sonorities and the local particularities of Muslim singing and Muslim chants to be lost. And we think that that's a great shame. Take the Qasid al Burda, for instance. Qasid al Burda is said to be the world's most widely memorized poem. It's probably, for that kind of reason, the world's most frequently sung words. Everywhere you go in the Muslim world, you'll find that people know the Burda and that they sing it, whether they're little kids or old people or women gathering together. The singing of the Burda is gigantically important. 